Beloved in the Lord, please be seated. I wonder if you're sensing what I am this morning, which is a very gentle move of God through his spirit among us. And may we continue that as we pray. Lord, you are our good shepherd. You care for us and you love us with an everlasting love. We ask you to speak to us this morning, to guide us, yes, to carry us and to save us into eternity and in your name we pray, amen. The title of today's message is The Shepherd's Heart. The Shepherd's Heart. God had a bunch of different names in the Old Testament. For example, king, judge, ruler, Almighty God. But there was one name used for God that stood out in contrast to all these different titles. It was shepherd. For example, Psalm 80. Hero, shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. This majestic, transcendent view of God is consistent with how God is described in the Bible, but yet that name, shepherd, it's different. Because shepherds were not held in high regard in that culture. Yet God is pleased to be called a shepherd. Shepherds lived outdoors. They were exposed to the elements. They had no socioeconomic status. Even by the time of Jesus, they couldn't even testify in a court of law. That's how lowly they were in society, and yet God is pleased to be called a shepherd. And shepherds, according to the scriptures, did two things. They were lovers and they were fighters. Lovers and fighters. And as we look at Psalm 23, we get a picture of what this looks like. This is affectionately known as the shepherd psalm, written by King David, who himself was a shepherd. And the first three verses show his good shepherd as the lover of his soul. And the last three verses show the shepherd as one who fights for his soul and for all of our souls. So let's go through Psalm 23 first. Then we're gonna look at Jesus, who identified himself as the good shepherd. And we'll talk about how this speaks to us today in this world we live in. So we begin the first verse of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, right there, we have something significant happening. This is one of the first moments in the Old Testament scriptures where someone recognizes a personal relationship with God. Notice David doesn't say the Lord is a shepherd or the Lord is the shepherd. No, he says the Lord is my shepherd a personal recognition of God being so close, caring so deeply for him, as if he were the only sheep in the world. And that's how God sees you, by the way. As if you were the only soul worth saving in the world, he would and he does. The Lord is my shepherd. There's that personal walk with God David's exemplifying in his words and in his heart. Because David was called a man after God's own heart. Here it is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, meaning God will supply his every need, which is one of the promises that goes into the New Testament. Whether it be body, mind, or spirit, God promises to supply every need. I shall not want, I shall have no lack, David's saying, because the Lord's my shepherd, he's with me. Verse two, he leads me and makes me sit down in green pastures. Now if you know anything about sheep, they're constantly eating, and they'll eat anything pretty much, especially desert scrub, but there's no nutrients in that. So the shepherd is going to lead the sheep to green pastures and make them lie down, because the sheep will eat and eat and eat until it's gorged and it will die. It's the shepherd's responsibility to keep moving the sheep to nutrient pastures and to make sure that they keep moving or lie down and stop eating for a while. This is the care of the shepherd. He leads me by still waters. Sheep can't drink out of running streams. They'll fall in and drown. Sheep are completely powerless. They need constant care. All we like sheep have gone astray, we read throughout the scriptures, and it's true. Left to our own devices, we often self-destruct. We go adrift. And God, our shepherd, wants to bring us into that place of, of safety, that place of light life and love, and to give us living water through those still waters that only he can provide. Verse three, he revives my soul and leads me in right pathways for his name's sake. This means that his name as the shepherd is a name that conveys love and care 
in a right pathway, a right direction in life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This means that God will not lead you astray. He will not lead you into temptation, as the Lord's Prayer prays. No, he will take you exactly where he wants you to go into all that is good and true and beautiful. He won't take you up on a cliff and leave you. He'll lead you. This is the love of the shepherd. And now we look at the fight of the shepherd. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me, he says. Notice David doesn't say, if I ever possibly will go through a dark valley, I think God will be with me. No, he says, when I go through, which is to say we're all going to go through dark valleys in life. Some of us might be there right now. And the promise is that God is right by your side. He sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's that dark valley of the shadow of death that we face all the time. And we fear no evil because Christ who fights for our souls is with us. Because he has something with him. Two instruments that a shepherd would carry. A rod and a staff. What are those? You might know that the bishop through the bishop's office has as a symbol the shepherd's crook. That's the staff. With the turned edge, it's meant to corral the sheep when they go astray. It is actually a fighting instrument of sorts because it's the shepherd fighting to bring the sheep back. If a sheep rolls on its back and it stays there, it will die. It cannot get up on its own. So the shepherd's crook would lift and prop the sheep back up. This is the fight of the shepherd for us. But there's also another instrument, the rod. And this was for one thing and one thing only, to do battle against the enemy, the predator. King David, when he was a young shepherd boy, went to fight Goliath. You might know this story. He tries to justify his credentials to the king who doesn't think he can handle the fight. And he says, don't you know that I not only fought off, but I killed a lion and a bear that tried to take my sheep. And then he went into the battle. We know how the story goes. That rod was for one thing and one thing only, to fight off the enemy. This is the enemy that Jesus would describe when he called himself the good shepherd. He said, the enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they might have life and might have it abundantly. That rod is the fighting instrument of the shepherd who fights back evil for us all the time. The next moment of fight is this. This verse that follows says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me or in the presence of my enemies. This means that there is always a pitched battle we're facing, a cosmic battle for our souls. The good shepherd knows this. And so on this field of battle, which is what is symbolized here, as the fiery arrows are flying, there's the invitation to a party, a banquet table, where the good shepherd is essentially saying, little sheep, just sit back and relax. In fact, have fun. Enjoy yourself. Have a party in the midst of the battle because the battle belongs to the Lord. It goes on to say, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. In that context, sheep often had agitating pests that would get into their eyes. The shepherd would fight for the health of those sheep by putting a special kind of ointment on the sheep's eyes and on their face to keep the pests out. Because if the pests could get into the eyes, there was a certain kind of fly at the time that would lay eggs in the eye of the sheep and it would start to get agitated and the sheep would start to bash their heads against rocks and ultimately they would die. Again, the shepherd comes for life. So he anoints their head with oil to keep those pests away that the sheep might live. We think about Jesus, the good shepherd, how he would lay his hands upon the weakest, the other abled, the marginalized, and give them sight and healing. We have such beautiful glimpses of Jesus as the good shepherd throughout the Bible. Yes, he would anoint a little sheep's head with oil, and their cup would overflow. This means that we have everything we need. We have abundance. Again, Jesus said in the context of fighting off the predator who he calls a thief, I came that they might have life. It might not just have life, but might have it abundantly, that it would flow out of our lives, that because of the nearness of God, our shepherd, we have everything we need, and that abundance can flow into the lives of others, which is about to take us to our application pretty soon. One last verse. Surely, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Because what's happened is the shepherd is leading and guiding the sheep. You know, in some cultures, the sheep are driven from behind, like in Australia. Huge swaths of sheep are guided and actually driven by a rancher in a truck cab and a bunch of ferocious dogs. It's a pretty frightening thing for sheep, but not for the biblical shepherd. No, the shepherd leads gently for his namesake. And that's how the little sheep in this psalm recognizes that through the love and the fight of the good shepherd for that sheep, the promise is being carried through this life and in the life to come. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not long ago, archaeologists discovered in modern day Syria a bunch of mosaics that they unearthed in house churches and other little communities. And they found something interesting. The images in the mosaics that they found were not images of a cross. It was not the Blessed Virgin Mary and child. The images they kept finding time and time again were of a shepherd with a human-sized sheep on the shepherd's back. And this tells us that the earliest Christians recognized Christ as the good shepherd who would carry them on his back through this life and in the life to come. Now, Jeremiah, our first reading for this morning, was written about 500 years after Psalm 23, after David had this vision of God as the good shepherd. But something had happened. A bunch of false shepherds had risen up, oppressing people, hurting them, not feeding the flock. And so Jeremiah calls them out as the Lord speaks through him. And the promise is that God would send another, a righteous one. We believe that to be Jesus, who called himself the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. Greater love has no one than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I know my sheep. They know my voice. They will not follow a stranger, but only my voice. Just as a shepherd would gently lead the flock, the shepherd at that time in Jesus' life was known to have a certain call to the sheep, their own sheep. It would be their own sing-songy little song they would have for them. And as they'd call out to the sheep, the sheep would follow the shepherd. But if someone else came along and tried a different song, the sheep would run away. This is how intimately and closely Jesus, the good shepherd, knew his own. He still speaks. Do you hear his voice as he sings love over you and tells you that you are enough, that he sees you, that he cares for you? that he fights for you and he loves you. Jesus, the ultimate lover and fighter, took that passion he has for the sheep to the cross. He said, I lay my life down of my own accord. No one takes it from me and I will take it up again. And through his death and resurrection for our sins and for the sins of the whole world, he lives and reigns and still continues to move among us in this world through his spirit with a shepherd's heart. Do you know the shepherd's heart beats for you as if you were the only sheep in the world? I've been talking to some young people lately who have been expressing understandably deep, deep concerns about this world they're inheriting. One person said to me, it seems like a bunch of tyrants around the world are now working together. Bad things seem to be happening. War is constantly on the horizon. Is the world getting worse? That's a complex question. A case could be made for that. But I think it's helpful to also, especially for the emerging generation, to consider a larger context of what's happening in our world, especially as it concerns God's shepherd's heart, who so loves this world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want to take you back to a different shepherd for a moment in context here. You might remember that Moses, after being raised as a prince of Egypt, recognized that he was truly a Hebrew and just couldn't deal with that, and he had all kinds of emotion and rage about it. He ended up murdering a man, buried him under the sand, had to leave Egypt, and was exiled way far away, and God made him a shepherd. For years, Moses, this former prince of Egypt was suddenly caring for the flock. But then God called him back to lead those very people out of oppression 
and a life of degradation under false shepherds in Egypt, you could say, into the land of promise. Now Moses, by God's grace, did a lot of things, but one thing he did, and you can read about this in Exodus 18, God through Moses established a government, not just any government, but the first representative republic based on law in the history of the world. The reason this is significant is because it created structure and life for people, and that largely informed the formation of our country. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, finds in part its inspiration from the very government that God had Moses set up. In a word, it allowed freedom. Consider these statistics when we think about where is our world going. In the early 19th century, world poverty had been eradicated by 80%. Why? Because those that were of a Judeo-Christian mind and worldview, through charity and care and love, and fighting the good fight for justice brought that into the world. It's still happening. That gap of extreme poverty is closing. This American experiment we're part of. By 1900, 25% of the world's population was able to experience free elections. This was new. It started to, to spread from Moses to this part of the world historically out into the broader world. 100 years later, by the year 2000, 50% of the world was holding free elections. There's something happening there I think we should see. This year alone, 4.1 billion people, that's half the world's population, and 66 countries will have the freedom to choose their next leader. This is the shepherd's heart, working both through the sacred and the secular. That influence cannot be missed of what's happening. There is a freedom reboot of sorts happening around the world, which we so often miss because we see such evil so prominently displayed, but something's happening too on the other side of that, that God's goodness is so much bigger than all evil, that even though the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, as Jesus said, he comes for abundance, for life, a bias toward life and justice and love, it's happening. We need to see that balance. Jesus spoke of this. Matthew 24 is where we read about it. Jesus said, when he's talking about the end times and his disciples were saying, what's gonna happen to this world? He said, evil will increase, and the love of many will grow cold. We see that, don't we? But those who endure to the end will be saved, and the gospel will be preached into all the world as a testimony, and then the end will come. And so this is where we are, friends. As God who so loves the world, whose shepherd's heart is beating all the time, works in ways we can't fully understand, but it's helpful to see the bigger picture that we as the church have an incredible opportunity, both abroad but also close at home, to be shepherds ourselves, to shepherd those in our care into God's love and to fight for them. So as we wind up this message and bring it close to home again, how are you shepherding? You who are filled with the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the presence of your heavenly Father in you, do you have a shepherd's heart? Who do you want to love? Who do you want to fight for? How are you doing it? It starts in your home, perhaps, or among your friend group, or the workplace, or your community and neighborhood. And here's what we've learned. Wagging a finger is not the way to shepherd. It doesn't work quite as well as opening your arms and your heart and saying, you're enough, you're seen, you're loved. Let me not just show you the good shepherd, but allow you to experience the good shepherd's love in me by being accepting, merciful, and full of light, life, and love. Because the world doesn't care how much we know. The world simply wants to know how much we care. May God's shepherd heart be made present in you and expand to those you love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.